Are you gonna have fun with all your buddies? Or these yeah, are... yeah. I love fun. I have lots of fun. So, so... I... Well, Rusty is a very old friend, and my name is McGee Hickey, as Rusty well knows. So Rusty and I were friends in college. So if Rusty and I had married, he married a much better woman than me. But I would be McGee, McGee. And Rusty's one of my favorite people. He's the kindest, nicest, list soul. He's a great human being, and I consider myself really lucky to have him as a good friend. I'm going to start to cry. <laughs> happy birthday, Rusty. Rusty, happy pre-birthday, man. You're the best. The I'll best, the absolute best. Monday. When you love Rusty, you fall in love forever. Rusty is one of the most talented people that I know. I wear huge fans of Rusty McGee's. Uh, not only is he funny, he's clever, intelligent, very musical, and uh, an all-around great guy. And he's always <laughs> Rasta McGee. And he's, yes, and, and my husband's favorite is Rasta McGee. Rasta McGee. <laughs> Um, I was so lucky that I had a chance to see the play The Green five times, and Rusty started to get worried that I was becoming a groupie, but it was the most ingenious, creative, and funny production I've ever seen. I still think it's the best off-Broadway or Broadway show in the last 25 years, and I was lucky to see it, and that was my early introduction to Rusty. I know that Greenheart is going to have many lives ahead of it, but it made me so impressed with how multi-talented Rusty is, and I feel lucky to know him. Thank you. Rusty! I love him. The only Scotsman I could find the words to say I love him. Well, that's all right. No, Rusty, I love you. You're cheap but beautiful. You're mischievous but innocent. You're red-headed and balding. I love you. <laughs> I want to say this. There is no collaborator like Rusty. Nobody's faster, nobody's better, and nobody's as inspired. He's really good. Get the close-up. He's really good. Oh, you're coming, my guest! You people, he's coming! He's coming! and Nat for It's an unbelievable turnout for a person that everyone loves. Uh, I thought if it was for me, I'd get 40. <laughs> so he's definitely got about 250 guests here. Um, I, my friendship with Rusty goes back 20 years, since 1982 when Rand and Lewis and Rusty started working here and do, doing plays and musicals. And they put me on the map, so thank you for that. And uh, it's just an honor and a pleasure to uh, have Rusty as a friend and his family. And 
there is in the front row. I didn't even see him there. Uh, I've known him half my life, and uh, he looks younger than the day I met him. So uh, he's doing something right. Uh, at any rate, uh, it's, it's, it's a great night, and we're here to honor you, Rusty, for uh, your friendship and the love that you've shown all of us in the room here. And uh, you, you're very much loved, and, uh, and of course, that comes from you loving us so much. And uh, it's really, uh, I mean, any, any time, I've, I went, had the pleasure actually to visit you in a hospital a couple times when you were there. And uh, it was just extraordinary, the amount of support that uh, you've experienced. And <clears throat> of course, it, it's people giving back to you what you've given to them their whole life. And uh, so it's just great to have everybody here. And uh, I'm just, it's, it's just terrific. Uh, I, I know from my own life experience, I have one friend from, gra from grammar school, from kindergarten. <laughs> Rusty's got every friend from every class, from every school, from every state, and a couple of Europeans that came in too. Uh, I don't know how you keep it all together, but you do. Here in France. <laughs> and he speaks French. And that was the best entrance, by the way, ever, the, when you came in upstairs. Uh, at this point, I would like to introduce and bring onto the stage Rusty's other wife, Louis Black. <laughs> You know, nothing, nothing has fucking changed in 20 years. It's unbelievable. Say, nothing, 20 years, you think a little maturity, a little something. Nothing. Same group of assholes in the same room. You know, Russ, uh, the reason a lot of these people came is because you personally have sent out more flyers <laughs> to more individuals than pretty much, this you could take the last five Broadway seasons and you have sent more flyers to people. I'll be eating dinner uptown this week. You can catch me at this diner. <laughs> So a lot of the people came because they thought, well, I didn't see the last nine shows. Well, I'll get to this one. Uh, it was a real pleasure it's, it, for me to be able to work with Rusty for, for, the, for, for the last fucking forever. Um, one of, there's a couple of really great moments that we, we had together and I'm, uh, that I'd like to share with you. Um, the first is the, uh, the night that Rand, who was working with us down here, left us alone to run the room. Rand Forrester was the artistic director and the one who had just about uh, this much responsibility going for him, which was like 10 times more than Rusty and I together. And Rusty and I separate might have been able to cope, but Rusty and I together, it's like, well, I'll have a drink, will you? <laughs> We had a show down here that was one of the worst shows in the history of mankind. Even if those people are here this evening, oh, I don't care. It was, it was unbelievable. It was, well, it was, it was the guilty philosopher. You remember that, Rusty? It was, uh, it was sung. It was sung. It was all sung. With some sort of mime movement and a, a, lot, of, a lot of kind of mime. Rand left because he fucking booked it. And, and on stage, we, we, they were like, they had put up a, a, a bunch of, what are those pipettes? The, a word that I, fucking amazing, I remembered. Pipettes. 
with oil dripping, and there was kind of, uh, you know, there was candles lit everywhere to begin with, which we kept going, wow, that's, I think that's dangerous. Because that was back when, when the room wasn't like this. This room was a complete dumpster, and they were like, you know, and, and I don't think any of the curtains had been fireproof, because we hadn't thought of that. And the pipettes, they were dripping oil, and he lit those. And he's singing, and it's, it's Rusty would do from time to time, guilty, guilty philosopher. And that was really the, that was it. That was the core of the show. <clears throat> and at that point, he and I both, we, we were looking, we said, well, the place could go. Uh, I said, he said to me, I don't think we want to be down here for that. And we walked upstairs and waited until they came up and to see if everybody was safe. My other, uh, one of the, uh, <clears throat> truly one of the, the great experiences of my life was to, was to collaborate with Rusty and with, and with Rand on a show called The Czar of Rock and Roll, you know. And that's most of the audience that saw it in New York. <laughs> they, they kept coming back, yeah, you were all in it. <laughs> Well, our, our, it was really a great pleasure for me, and, and, our, and uh, our friend David Hart had, had struck a, some sort of a deal with the Alley Theater in Houston that we're still, we're still checking out. Um, <laughs> and Russ, Rand, and I went down to, uh, to Houston together to work on this show. And, uh, and we did everything we could. Uh, we did everything we possibly could. We had taken basically a 70-minute musical and turned it into a 95, to, we, we, we made it a two-act musical. Rusty had done a, a tremendous amount of work creating new songs. We, me and I and Rand would sit and talk to the critics and say, hey, we're really just workshopping this, you know? And that was kind of, you know, we tried to do everything right. Rusty knew exactly what rock and roll stations we should get on. We were, we were, he was doing all the homework that had to be done. And it, in the evenings, we would go to this bar. And the bar was really, it's called the Nice House. And, and the reason we'd go there is, it, it was, it's, in Houston, it's just, well, it's, it's the end of the universe. So in Houston, they'd have this bar where you could, it was like 75 cents for a beer. Or if you brought in your bottle of liquor, it was a quarter to get ice. So, hello, we're all there. And they treated us really well. And there was a woman who owned the place, and she'd never been to the theater. And she was going to see our show the night it opened. And Rusty and I were seated there. And we couldn't have been more excited. And the first act started. And it was the best it had ever been. Because it was, it was hard. We were doing a, a new show, really, in three and a half weeks. And it's kind of like watching, when you got a new show, it's like watching a, you know, like one of those rickety planes, kind of like trying to take off. But this time it started to soar. And son of a bitch, the first act worked. The first act worked. We're going to get by. They're not going to see our underwear tonight. <coughs> the second act begins. And we're ecstatic. We're thinking, and it starts. And that's always been crazy. That never comes close. And it's going even better. And eight minutes into it, we hear this noise, this kind of just vague retching sound. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the theater, by the way, is in the round. So Rusty and I are seated here, <clears throat> and we're looking across. The two critics are literally almost directly across from us, and seated behind them is our friend, our friend from the bar. The one who'd been helping us with all those drinks. The one who'd never been to the theater before. And she was just kind of getting a little sick, and then she, and then she threw up. And not just a little throw up, but you know, one of those where you go, oh, wow. <laughs> maybe, maybe she got rid of all of it. That'll be just one, it'll be one throw up. The entire cast began to gather. Everyone who was off stage trying to get her to leave. Just come on, come on with us. No, oh, no. I mean, she wanted to see the show. She wasn't going to leave. She's a trooper. <laughs> she hashes again. 
now the critics are kind of like turning around and you can, you can get a sense that the spell is permeating the air. <laughs> At the third one, Rusty turned to me and he, he said, did you hear that sound? That's the sound of our careers going in the toilet. <laughs> It's, uh, it's really my pleasure this evening, Rusty, to present, uh... <laughs> I've learned a lot on the road. You take a pause, let the people settle, and then go into some other fucking stupid voice. <laughs> we have a very special uh, show for these, you this evening, which you have no idea about, do you? No, I don't. Yeah, because that... The, this is, uh, you know, with all the folks here, the icing, this is really the cake. Um, this is, uh, we, we uh, Allison has put together a, uh, a song cycle of your work, um, which we presented to you by uh, the lovely Mary Testa, Rebecca Luker, and Allison Fraser. <laughs> And uh, we're going to put it on. It, it, it's it's going live onto a CD as we speak, and uh, and uh, we will have a CD of your work for you. That that's going to. I think we're going. Uh, we'll we'll talk about the charge for that. <laughs> Steve and I. Steve hasn't negotiated that with us yet. And uh, but I think. Uh, I couldn't be happier than to, than to spend an evening sitting back and, and uh, listening to your work as a composer. Yeah. You're the fucking... Yeah. Yeah. Allison Fraser. Yeah. Rebecca Luther. Yeah. Mary Testa. I'm turning masochistic, that I need to see a shrink. Who'll interpret my dreams, make me scream primal screams, explore my shattered ego and my battered end, introduce me to my long lost inner kid. Hi. <laughs> I don't need someone else to tell me what my problem is. I myself know just exactly what my problem is. My problem is, my problem is. I am feeling so much pain right now. I am trying to deal with the fact that this heel really hurt me now. But I have to decide that I won't run and hide from emotions. I'm learning a lot about pain. I'm determined to learn from this pain, this depression. Overwhelms my soul. I must learn not to wallow in feeling so shallow. Pain takes its toll. But I have to be strong and say, woman, it's wrong to be suffering. There's potential for growth from my pain. I am feeling quite good about pain. I ask myself, why not cry when I possibly should from this? It's a lesson I have finally learned. Giving in to desire is playing with fire, and I got burned. But I'm going to survive, and I might even thrive from this heart. 
3.141592626 The atomic weight of every element from the periodic table I'm able Ask me why it's mineral or animal or vegetable I'll supply the most minute details When my mind's capacity is tested on last evening It fails, it fails, it fails he took my hand and we quietly walked And after a minute I think we talked about something important Of consequence to me But it's all a little blurry Did I seem awkward and ill at ease? Was I standoffish or eager to please? Did we walk slowly or keep up a brisk pace? Did he touch his hand to my face? We may have talked about the weather Love, I'm confused by it all. We may have sat in silence, he may have kissed my cheek, but I really can't recall. I can't recall. Did we make eye contact when we spoke? And was he serious or was it a joke? Did he tell his secrets? Just what did he reveal? And just how did that make me feel? I try to recreate the but every time I keep hitting a wall I'd like to paint the picture But I only draw a blank Cause I really can't recall I can't recall I can speak for hours on molecular photosynthesis Genus, species, subspecies of plant Ask me to explain this magic feeling sweeping over me I can't, I can't, I can't Situations absurd. I'm really not sure of what word or did he say he'd come tomorrow? Or have I set myself up for a fall? I know I wasn't dreaming, I know I'm not insane, but I think I'm giving up on what was formerly my brain. Yes, he might have said he wants me. Yes, he might. Water and shade and love. 
7th Street, you let her run away. It's him turning up so drunk and stoned you pray that he won't stay. It's a never ending argument. It's the only matinee. It's a New York romance.
It's a moving romance, it's a stifling romance, it's a romance of the streets. It's a he said romance or an I meant romance, it depends on who you meet. It's a subway door that closes and you only see the pain. Or a big lit Grand Central while you're waiting for her train. It's a cross town connection, it's a taxi in the rain. It's a New York romance It's all the times you thought that you were going But you didn't go, you stayed It's all the times you thought that you were making love When you were getting laid It's a New York romance it's a ringside romance, it's a terrible surprise. It's a last ditch romance, it's a desperate romance telling hopeful little lies. It's a girl you thought might be Miss Wright till you find out she's a bore. For the guy who said he'd stay all night is halfway out the door. It's a great big apple you're afraid is rotten at the core. Taking so much shit from lovers that they're not friends anymore. It's a wanting to be far away on some distant shore. It's a careful desperation. It's not caring anymore It's a New York romance That was uh, the song that Rusty brought to us one night and We've been living kind of a happy-go-lucky lifestyle down here it was 1983, things were fun. Single, who gave a shit? Then fucknut has to sit down at the piano and go, <laughs> Then we had to go, God, there's more to Rusty than we thought. <laughs> yeah, you're giving us a great deal, it's amazing. What's amazing is, is that I knew Rusty at, uh, when he was four and I was 11. And at four, he was already doing more than I was doing. At four, it was like, do I look at the stamp collection today? Do I learn the accordion? Do I go to cooking school? Do I study for the kindergarten exam? Son of a bitch, I don't know where to start, Lou. But it's true, I mean, on stage, too, it, it, you know, it would be like, where, you know, it was like one thing, and then he, and the thing that just irritates you <laughs> is that he had created that song, and then, and then and it really became kind of an anthem for us pathetic group of <laughs> schmucks back there. You know who you are, you know who you are. <laughs> and, uh, and then we, and then, we, and then every week he'd come up, oh, do you think I should sing it? Sing it! Hey, you think? Are you sure? Sing it! Sing it! Sing it! <laughs> then you made us beg you, and then you go, oh, I'm not, and then he'd sing it. <laughs> the last, the last two numbers, uh, I've got to check because they didn't know the, uh, the, the first one is Winter's, Winter Journey, which is, uh, the, one of the first songs, the oldest song in the, in the show tonight, which is, uh, was written in 1978, when, when Rusty was 11. <laughs> <laughs> the latest, um, and the last song is the, the latest song that he's written, um, which was just a couple of months ago, called Thanks in Old Age, and uh, that one is the only one with a, a lyric collaborator on it. And that collaborator is Walt Whitman. <laughs> Cold earth below me, gray skies above. It's funny, but I'm right here at home. So close yet so far from the one I love. 
God, I feel so hard alone. I came home to family. I came home for keeps to recapture the good times I had.
shall laurel ere I go to life's war's chosen ones, a soldier from an ended war. Return. Thanks in old age. Thanks ere I go. Thanks joyful thanks. A soldier. Traveler's thanks, sweet It was Chris McGovern on piano. <laughs> Rebecca Luker, Mary Testa, Allison Frazier. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Rusty McGee. Today I consider myself self, 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 self. <laughs> the luckiest man, 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 man. It's a very special night for me because, well, tomorrow I start on my tour as Daddy Warbucks in Little Orphan Annie. <laughs> It's a bus and truck. Susan Stroman is directing it to non-equity production. That's a joke for the Ann Arbor crowd. There are there people upstairs and people on Dag Hammerskull Plaza watching this program right now? Dag Hammerskull, the guy you don't hear a lot about lately, you know? When I think of all the great secretary generals of the UN, you know? Dag. Who remembers you, Thant? You, you. They always, last week they published the top 10 names that babies were named in New York City. I always expect to see you in the top 10. It's never there. Um, thoroughly, thoroughly, and totally fooled. Yes. Um, you know, in ways that like, you know, I'm seeing Kevin Spacey in The Usual Suspects going from like this to, and then walking straight. You know, it's like, my wife did, did a stratagem that uh, rivals a Tom Clancy novel. Uh, I think I know now why she almost bit my hand off when I reached for her cell phone once. Because I think like many other things, uh, an event like this with the surprise factor could not have been uh, accomplished in, in, in an earlier age without a lot of uh, notes handed and billy doos and stuff. Billy doos. <laughs> Lewis will uh, provide. <laughs> Mark and Joanna are saying, take out the French, take it out of the act. It won't play in Peoria. 
Um, email. Email. There you go. That's that's what does it too. That's right. Email and and uh, cell phones and and sex and candy. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's like a contemporary song, and I'm trying to get it in for the young folks there. You know? I'd like to do my medley of Limp Bizkit tunes now, too. Um, do we have places to go? Because I, I just, could, could I go over to the piano? Um, Christopher McGovern sat here and played my melodies and my, my, uh, my songs beautifully. And Mary, Mary Testa, uh, Rebecca Luker, and Allison Frazier. Um, uh, let the man who... Sightlines. There we go. Sightlines, all important. Uh, let the man who is... Uh, oh, I didn't know we had this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hank Myman. Um, and it was very appropriate the sh that the show started with Steve, Steve Olson, who started my career here in New York City 21, 21 years ago. And, and to have Rand Forster uh, here tonight, who ran the West Bank Cafe uh, downstairs theater bar with Lewis and I for 10 years. Um, I, uh, I am so, I, I say this every night, that I uh, am blessed with the, the love of family and friends and could not in my wildest, uh, wildest dreams have imagined that they would be so uh, loving and supportive to, to put together an evening uh, of this magnitude because this just, this, this, um, this is, so healing to me and so therapeutically wonderful that I can't, I, I just can't tell you. Because I, you know, I, you know, I thrive on this shit. It's like, uh, I, um, uh, my balls just got about three sizes bigger. Um, do balls have sizes? Uh, no, I just, yeah, thanks. And Nat, we'll have a talk about that a little bit later. It's not your bar mitzvah today. I don't know, it makes me think about the years we spent in this room. That's Grafasi, isn't it? Yeah. Sing the old songs, Rusty. Yeah, do it. We sang so many songs in this room starting in 1982. And there was a world out there to conquer, a world, the world of Manhattan, the world of New York City, and the world beyond it. But we stayed down here in our little basement. <laughs> You know why? You know why we stayed down here? Well, because we thought we were better than them. We had all gone to Yale Drama School and we... Well, to tell you the truth, we were better than them. But, you know, we didn't want to violate the prime directive. A few Star Trek fans laugh. We all know that Kirk and Picard are not allowed to change a planet's culture. But Lewis and I and Rand decided we would try to change the planet's culture. And so we snuck out there in the dead of night and pretended to be theater artists. 
And we looked at what they had to offer and we said, we can do better than that. And we wrote our own musicals. And we did our own stand-up comedy routines. And we, we sang our own song and we directed our own plays and we were summarily rejected by everybody. <laughs> it was kind of a bummer. Sure, we were before our time, or we were after our time, or we were right during our time, but in the wrong place at the right time. And we watched people who were our peers and our equals ascend the heights to fame. And we sang their song. I can't live if living is without you. I can't give, I can't give anymore. I can't live if living is without you. Rusty found a cute little uh, device. It was to change the word you to Lou in every song. I can't live if living is without Lou. For, for a while, we were a team. I would open for Lou or he would open for me. But let's flash forward. It's the 80s. No, wait, it's the 90s. No, wait, it's the thousands. And now here we are in the year 2002. Did we ever think we'd say that, children? No. I, I immediately subtract tw 12 years from any conversation I have about anything because my mind cannot quite wrap itself around the fact that it is the year that it is. But... best, but I guess my best wasn't good enough. That's all I have to say. Uh, we gave our best, and I have, I am so proud to have seen Lewis's star rise, because it is ascendant. You sure I know what you're thinking? He's kind of cute, bald. But you know, we hope that look don't last forever. Yeah, I guarantee you all, it's gonna grow back. But it'll still be a little bit thin in front. But I'm not obsessed about my hair, no, not too much. And I sang the songs of Bruce Springsteen on his stage when he appeared less than 12 blocks away on the same night. And I sat in this room and I sang the songs of Carol King when she sat right over there against the wall under the sconce light. And I sang, stayed in bed all morning just to pass the time. There's something wrong here that can be no denial. And I started waxing poetic about Carol King. She was sitting right over there. I said, you changed our lives with your songs. <laughs> Used to be so easy living here with you. You were bright and easy, and I knew just what to do. Now you look so happy, and I feel like a fool. Too late, baby, now it's too late, so we're ready to feel like fun. Something as hot as that, and I can't hide, and I just can't. What they do? Smile in your face. All the time they want to take your place, the backstabbers. Carol King, meet the OJs. OJs, Carol King. How appropriate that a song called Backstabbers was by the OJs. Oh, 
shoes. Yeah, I live in a very fashionable, attractive two-bedroom up on west side apartment. It's so big, sometimes I have to look around a little bit for my shoes. Yeah, and I, when I get a call every morning from Halstead Properties saying, do you know what the bedroom below you sold for yesterday? I get those old, I'm stuck here in New York and I ain't quite got it all going together and I'm fighting a dreadful fatal disease but my apartment's worth a shitload of money blue. <laughs> Well, I could move to New Jersey. I'd like to move back to Michigan. But I'm gonna stay right here in Manhattan. I don't wanna have to start my life all over again, yeah. I got the love of friends and family. I got everything a man could ever want and have, and I'm blessed and I'm happy as can be. for much longer. It all started in Georgetown Hospital on a hot summer day in 1955. You do the math. No, I'm not gonna go on for too much longer. I just wanna sing a couple songs that mean a lot to me and my brothers. Yeah, I got my two little brothers here tonight. And I'm singing the blues because I'm thinking about my older brother, Bobby McGee, who's no longer with us, but he taught me the love of the blues. We went to the Ann Arbor Blues Festival. You know, being the son of a neurologist growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I got a right to sing the blues. I miss Bobby a lot, but I know he's here with us in spirit tonight. And like I say, everything's okay, uptight and out of sight, and everything's gonna be all right. I got the, I ain't got no reason at all to sing the blues. Music makes its impression on us, usually at our youngest age, when we're in our early adolescence. And I sing in my comedy act about how maybe we're born in 1876 and the music of um, Ernest K. Balls came over the, came over the harmonium. <laughs> oh, the moon is bright tonight along the Wabash. Through the fields there comes the smell of new mown hay. Through the sycamore, the candlelights are gleaming on the banks of the Wabash far away. Or maybe it was World War II and you were 14 years old and you sang, For all we know, this may only be a dream. We come and go like the ripples on a stream. So love me tonight Tomorrow was meant for some Tomorrow may never come For all we know Maybe you were a teenager in the 1950s 
Peggy Sue, Peggy Sue. Pretty, 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 pretty. <laughs> Peggy Sue, my Peggy. My Peggy Sue. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Oh, I love you, girl. Yes, I love you, Peggy Sue. Maybe you were a teenager in the 1980s. Oh, we're halfway there now. Oh, living on a prayer now. Take my hand and we'll make it, I swear. Maybe you were a teenager in 1968. <laughs> Why do birds suddenly appear every time? I'm not going to go into all the songs that have this introduction. <laughs> Suddenly, this is morphing into a Burt Bacharach yeah. retrospective. <laughs> We've seen enough of those on PBS. So let's keep it uh, in the realm of Rusty McGee, uh, which is the realm of... Um... Now let's cut to the chase. You know, Allison, my lovely wife of 18 years... I love you so much for putting this together to bring together my brothers and, and Mike and Carol and Margaret and my Ann Arbor friends, Chuck and Josh and their sp spouses and all my loved ones whose names are just too innumerable to mention and I know you're all here and I just want to get off the stage so that I can give you all hugs and, and tell you how good I feel and how excited I am about my recovery and my... Can we... Can we write? Can we can we write one of those wrongs that happened in the universe? Can we just please make Rusty famous for a couple of years? That's all I ask. And you know, uh, and uh, let's avoid the P word because I don't want it posthumously. Please, I, I want it now. I want my cake. I want to eat it. So, Allison. Uh, Allison is very insightful. She's looked at the hundreds of songs I've written for, uh, for, uh, for the theater, for television, for film, for pop music, and she said, you've never written a song about me. And it's, you know, it's true, because I only write songs about events that make me sad or unhappy, and, and she has never done that. So um, I, I don't have a song that I've written for tonight, because I sure as hell didn't know this was going to happen tonight. But I, I, I get into my kind of universalist thing. I look into the lovely eyes of my wife, regardless of what co color they are. And, and <laughs> we can erase that part for the CD. Um, and, um, and I go back to what, ha what became my signature song, because when I look into the eyes of my wife, as I say, it doesn't matter what color they are. So let's sing this song that we know and love and I dedicate it to my wife um, yeah. hey where did we go yeah. days when the rains came we go down in a hollow and I remember I remember playing a new game Hiding behind a rainbow's fall In the misty morning fog The misty morning fog The misty morning fog I remember my heart was thumping with you 
brown eyed girl. You're on my, my, my brown eyed girl. Whatever happened, I want to know what happened. Today is just so slow. Going down the old mine with a transistor, transistor radio. It casts my memory back there, Lord. Sometimes, you know, I'm overcome. Sometimes I'm overcome thinking about making love in the green grass, making love in the green grass, making love in the green grass behind the stadium with you. My brown eyed girl. For me, that stadium was Ann Arbor, Michigan Stadium. <laughs> 101,000 capacity and it's up to like 107,000 now. Yeah. But I didn't know what Van Morrison was talking about when he was talking about making love in the green grass behind the stadium. I thought stadiums were meant for other purposes. <laughs> I was just a young virgin growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Shipped off to private school in seventh grade, never having tasted the savor of love. <laughs> yeah. You are on my, my, my brown eyed girl. Think about Van Morrison writing that song. Think about where's Van Morrison tonight? He's probably in a in a bar in Ireland or Wales somewhere singing old Rusty McGee tunes. Allison named this evening Sweet Appreciation, which is a lyric from the Walt Whitman poem that I set to music that we heard sung so beautifully by Rebecca Luker. And so I give you all my sweet appreciation. Um, you, you are loved and you are cherished and let us, uh, you know, just let, let's love each other. Let's, um, let's carry forth uh, healing and loving thoughts to me to all the people who need comfort in the world. And um, God, God is love, love is God, and God bless you and may love enwrap in, in, in your souls and encase you. Um, point all your arrows in the same direction, and that is love yourself. Love yourself as much as you can and love everybody else as much as you can. And I'm, I'm trying to start to live my life by those two ideas and approach every every decision uh, I make, every breath I take, every chord I make. I'll be I'll be watching you. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for what is just a remarkable, wonderful evening. Uh, let's do a couple of courses of. Uh, do you remember when? I want to hear y'all sing. We used to sing. Sha la 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 just a whisper now. And Nancy and Cindy singing. And everybody just whisper it now. And the three men I admire most. Henry Winkler, Ronnie Howard, and Donnie Most. They caught the last train for the coast. The day that Potsy died. And we were singing bye-bye. And good old boys were drinking whiskey and rice. 
imagine me and you? I do. I think about you day and night. Why am I looking at Carol while I sing this? <laughs> to think about the girl you love and hold her tight, so happy together. So I should call you up, invest a dime, and you say you belong to me. I lose my mind. Imagine how the world could be so very fine. Si contente ensemble. You don't know how many times I've wished that I could hold you. You don't know how many times I've wished that I could mold you. You don't know how many times I wish that I could hold you into someone who would cherish me as much as I cherish you. And I'm looking over at girls I slept with everywhere. <laughs> And you know, I think I've taken this staying in touch thing to an extreme. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I have to find a way to end it, as my college actor teacher told me. Uh, Lou, you're the pro. We're going to uh, actually have the cake, and then we're going to come back and do another show so you can actually structure it. This gives you time to think about it, Russ, something that I know you love to do. Because that'll allow you to distract yourself. This will give you two jobs. Greeting everybody, and what the fuck are you going to do when it's over? <laughs>